I'm Bill Vales. I'm here today with Tony DeAngelis. In our previous show, we talked about the geologic time scale and how geologists use this to place certain events within uh, the Earth's history and how to place them in, in, in order. Tony, um, we just scratched the surface. Oh, just barely. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank you for being here again. And uh, uh, we can continue our uh, discussion. We we tried last time to sort of set a very broad stage, mm -hmm. if, you, if you will, and uh, then we went back to the Cambrian period, which was, oh, 540 million years ago, right? plus Just or about, minus yeah. a little bit, and we're working our way up, and we didn't get very far. <laughs> Not at uh, all. Um, but now, we're going to be talking about a period known as the Coal Period, Okay. Want to uh, tell the audience a bit of what is the coal period? Well, the coal age basically was a time uh, that uh, it's called the Carboniferous period, and that's further subdivided into the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian. Um, but it's basically a time when most of the uh, continent uh, of North America was covered with shallow inland seas, not really seas, more like swamp. Mm -hmm. and they had a myriad of ferns, of lycopods, and all these other plants. And as these were the dominant uh, plants, uh, well, dominant life form on, on uh, land and in these swamps, they, um, as they fell in, they, uh, they fell into the swamps and more and more, you know, fell in. Eventually, the coal deposits that we have today are all the remains of these plants. I see. Now, it's my understanding that there were there was so much veg vegetation that that would make for quite a bit different atmosphere than we have today because of uh, uh, carbon dioxide mm -hmm. and, and other gases. Yeah, it did, and it also made for uh, very acidic waters in the swamps. So it was the swamp water was pretty much devoid of oxygen. Okay. And that uh, allowed for, you know, as these uh, plants continuously died and, and fell in, you know, they'd make these tremendous deposits of peat, which is, you know, the semi-decomposed uh, plant material. Okay. Now, when we're dealing with an uh, environment that's devoid of oxygen, that's referred to as an anaerobic That's correct, uh, anaerobic an, an environment. environment. Now, it would seem to me that an anaerobic environment would probably um, uh, support fossilization. Well, it does because a lot of the stuff does not decay. Um, don't forget, in that period, uh, you did have well, not you didn't have much in the way of amphibians coming out of the uh, water yet, but you did have uh, you did have a lot of big insects, the two foot dragonfly, yeah, you know, yeah, these yeah. big yeah. giant centipedes and stuff. So um, they they were pretty pretty much all that you had on land, but the the uh, the plants were dominant. Okay. And as they fell into this, uh, you know, not as much decay as would normally occur happened. So you got the giant uh, peat deposits, and then further deposition and further time and heat and pressure, you know, continuously changed it into the coals that we know today. Okay, so let's uh, set the stage in terms of the, the material of the, the ground, the mm -hmm. surroundings. You have some yeah. samples um, here. Right, I have this one which is kind of hard to see but it's crumbly and that's peat, the actual deposit, uh, how it would be laid down, um, you know, after eons of, of uh, trees falling down and getting meta, uh, getting compressed, you know, you have peat. There are peat bogs today yep. in uh, the British Isles that they still use for, uh, you know, for uh, to a small degree for for you, uh, heat and so on. Yeah. When I was in uh, Ireland uh, years back uh, doing some work, 
uh, a primary source of fuel over, over there was peat. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would go to the peat bogs. People would go to <laughs> right. the peat bogs and cut out their slabs of peat, mm -hmm. let them dry a little bit, yeah. but they never really dried. That's true. <laughs> and, and they'd throw them in their fireplace, and they'd kind of smolder forever. <laughs> Right. Um, but peat was a uh, primary um, um, form of heat. I think in Littleton, Mass., which are our primary viewing audience, we have some old peat bogs there that have been uh, farmed down off of uh, Taylor Street. Really? But, uh, yeah. Oh, I never knew that. Yeah, wow. yeah, which is pretty much at the intersection of um, uh, Route 2 and 495. Wow. So this is a very... See you. I'd like to see them. Great. Okay. So, Pete's uh, uh, pretty much on the, the first gradation. Right, fuel and oil. it's very inefficient as a fuel source, but okay. it is. The next on the thing is lignite coal, which is a low, uh, low value, you know, heat source, but it's better than the peat, of course, and that's mm -hmm. the first real step in, in coal formation. Okay, so to form lignite, uh, was that peat under more pressure? Usually, uh, under under much more pressure, and it could be, uh, you know, silts and other things because a lot of the coal is shale beds. Yes. So that's what happens is, you know, it continuously accretes, and more time and pressure, you get lignite. Okay. And again, it's very low value for fuel, but it's better than you know freezing. And better than peat. Right. And then uh, the next gradation up is bituminous, which uh, also called brown coal, I believe. Okay. And uh, that, oh no, lignite I think is brown. That's black and anthracites are classified. So, <laughs> so bituminous coal, uh, I know folks that live in the West Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, Pennsylvania area, mm -hmm. and they talk a lot about bituminous uh, Right, uh, because coal. It's, it's very prevalent. It's the most abundant coal. Uh, it has a... Uh, a fairly good value. In fact, one of the biggest things that these were used for, um, semi-bituminous, was uh, the uh, big locomotives. Oh, okay. Yeah, you okay. know, they burned uh, coal, so um, yeah. they they used uh, bituminous coal okay. um, for the most part, and it has a moderate heat value, okay. and uh, again, it's better than lignite or peat. Okay. And and you're pointing over there because there's well, a, a train. Yes. There's a big locomotive yeah, over right. there. Big which locomotive we'll, model. We'll get a <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then a, uh, the okay. ultimate of course in coal is anthracite. anthracite. Now anthracite is is a coal. It's the hottest coal. You can see it looks almost like obsidian. Yes, it does. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that it's is denser. The, yeah, it's denser, very high heat value. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it's it's the result of the metamorphosis, extreme metamorphosis. So it's not just the stuff was buried and sort of settled. This this underwent a lot of metamorphic changes. But the coal there, and I think Pennsylvania has a good deal of, of anthracite. Yeah. It's the highest prized coal. Okay, so the process here: we have plants, they're dying. Yep. More plants, they're dying. Mm -hmm. They're compressing making peat, yep. then lignite, mm -hmm. then uh, bituminous coal. Right. And now you say there's a metamorphosis. Uh, well, yeah, metamorphism that uh, takes out most of the, uh, the uh, any liquids, uh, mostly, you know, you've got your carbon in there. That's almost pure carbon. So when it burns, it burns very sure. well, and not too much smoke. And, and we know there were some um, continental collisions going on mm -hmm. um, of continents coming Definitely, together, which yes. would account for the metamorphism. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, there were several pulses. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. That, I mean, the uh, boundaries continuously changing on yeah. that. Yeah. In terms of um, sulfur content, this would be the lowest. The lowest. Yes. This would be the lowest. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so this is clean coal. Yes, so it is. Uh, very, it's very clean burning and there's very little smoke. With this, you get more smoke, uh, some soot and ash from the bituminous. Lignite is amongst the worst, you know, um, and it has a lot of sulfur in it, produces a lot of smoke, a lot of ash. Okay. This having a little byproduct is a big advantage to it. Okay, so these are a result of of the, the carbon uh, of the carboniferous mm -hmm. uh, period, the accumulation of the plants. Okay, right. that's 
That's uh, great. Now, what kind of plants? Give us a, okay. a, a sense of what kind of uh, <clears throat> plants. And are we still talking invertebrate species? For the most part. And, and maybe uh, uh, tell our audience uh, a thumbnail of the difference between an invertebrate and vertebrate. Well, invertebrates have no backbone, and uh, most invertebrates are, are either insects or they're sea living, you know, creatures. And as time went on, you know, you get uh, different ones, bony structures are occurring, and of course, uh, you know, you get the uh, fishes, and some of those had backbones, and when they, uh, when they eventually evolved into lobe fin that could breathe air, you'd, they'd, you know, cross the line between fish and amphibian. Okay. And then eventually, you know, the amphibians became reptiles and so on. Okay. Where does the coelacanth? The coelacanth uh, was actually, it wasn't that old from what I remember. It was about 65, around the age of the dinosaurs, 60 million years yeah. ago. And they said it was extinct. I don't remember when it first came about. But for 60 million years, they said it was extinct. And then some, in 1939, some fishermen found a strange thing off the coast of Africa, the yeah. nets. They didn't know what it was. They called in the scientists. By the time they got there, it was pretty well rotted away. But yeah. they said, this is significant. And they offered, I think it was like a $100 reward, which is probably 1000 now, yeah. for anyone catching one. And it was nine months later, they caught another one. Yeah. And they called the scientists, and they got their money. And the scientists were happy because this hasn't been found you know, for 60 million years, yeah. but it still exists. Yeah. And the one thing about it is um, that it's a very strange looking one. Yeah. If you've gone to Harvard Museum, they have, have one in the case. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that yeah. tank. Yeah, they have a large, yeah. uh, really big, and it's there. ugly. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a pretty weird But it's, uh, that's one of the precursors to, uh, you, know, you know, to, um, well, I don't know if it has a modern corollary. I was going to say toward modern fish, but not necessarily. Yeah. Um, because sharks predate that, and they go back a long ways, too, in their evolutionary history. Well, let's uh, talk a bit about some of the um, uh, uh, plant matter. Well, the plants, um, <clears throat> I was at the uh, <clears throat> American Museum of Natural History, and I was fascinated when I went there with the dioramas of the Carboniferous period big giant coal plants with fronds hanging down and stuff. Most of them were of the fern type family. Mm -hmm. You had several uh, big ones. You had calamites, which had straight running ridges. You had, um, <clears throat> believe you have one? I think that's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Then you have a uh, sigillaria. Um, Lepidodendrum is another common one. And uh, I think we have I think one that's of those the Lepidodendrum, here. yep. So, uh, you know, you had those, and then uh, Sigillaria calamites, Lepidodendrum, and then in addition, you had lots and lots of fern plants mm -hmm. in great abundance, and some of them are, are here with the different ferns. Now, this one here is just a common, I think that's a Pecopteris, um, but in here, uh, just to show you something. I'm going to use the calamites okay. as a pointer. Very good. To yep. the, uh, <laughs> a, and what's this called again? A pectopterus. A pectopterus. Okay. Okay. And this one here uh, is nice because it has a lot of fern impressions, but this is actually coal shale. <clears throat> so it shows you where the coal, you know, transition from plant to showing the, in the coal shale. And you can see, as you would expect in a sedimentary mm -hmm. rock, the the layering, yep, the, the bedding, those, yeah, the bedding, mm -hmm. the bedding planes. Okay. And basically, you know, the uh, the abundance of these things was was fantastic. I mean, more coal shale. This is, I believe, this is the Marioptorus. Uh, yeah, that has the little veins. Marioptorus nervosa. Sounds like a. Uh, an eating disorder, but it's not. Okay. Uh, Mariopterus <laughs> nervosa. nervosa. And I have to tell you, these impressions are spectacular. Mm -hmm. Some of them, the detail that they show is great, and mm -hmm. you can really get a lot from the morphology <clears throat> by looking at them. Now, uh, uh, 
How, how do these impressions get formed? Well, there's, I mean, the types of fossils, there's basically two, the cast and the mold. Mm -hmm. And uh, the mold is where you have a fossil and the sediments form around it. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, the sediments will form around that and uh, the organic matter will decay away eventually, be, uh, will disappear. And then you will have something, usually either a silica or something like that, that fills up the mold, uh, the hole of the mold. So you've got now the uh, fossilized impression of uh, the plant or animal that was there. The other type is where you have um, where you have direct replacement. It's not uh, you know it's not a, a mold. It's just bit by bit you have uh, silica, or like in the case of this an agate, which is the petrified wood. Silica replaces, uh, you know, cell by cell, the organic matter. Uh, this is a beautiful example of petrified wood. Mm -hmm. That's been agatized, yep. Okay, agatized. Um, Which is what most of it is, yeah, agate replacement. Mm -hmm. um, nothing special, but I mean, it shows, you know, the replacement. Some of them are spectacular because the replacement is so fine that you can see the wood grain um, you know, the bark obviously on the outside, but you can see the annual growth rings. Yes, yes. And so that gives you a lot of insight upon what you're happening. But that's mm -hmm. how fossilization occurs in these. The plant matter has decayed some, uh, has decayed out, but it left the impressions in the, uh, in the coal shales, and you, that's what we have here left of most of these things. Tony, and, I had showed, showed th you this before, and this oh, is yes. a uh, Calamites. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this was found up at Joggins uh, ah. in, in Nova Scotia, which we'll talk about in a little while. Mm -hmm. But one of the interesting parts of this that, that struck me was when you look on the reverse side, mm -hmm. uh, you can really see the growth rings. Oh, yeah, definitely, you know, right. If, if you look on... And even from the end, that, they're, they're, uh, they show there. Yeah. That is amazing. That is one amazing piece. It really is. I think that's a fantastic piece. Joggins Cove is a hotbed for fossils. They have a lot of exposed uh, cliffs there, and yes, you know they have. Uh, that's the great thing about it. Sometimes, yeah, you could have fossils beneath your feet, but you won't know it unless there's a road cut. Um, my friend and I, uh, your brother, in fact, we traveled to uh, see Ed Wingate in New York yeah. for a Tesla convention, and we drove through uh, New York right through the area of Ordovician Shale. And I said, we should stop there and just take some of the graveyard right off the roadbed. I mean, it's, yeah. it is that yeah. shale, you yeah. know. And, and, and this is near the Vermont, uh, New no, York. No, Utica. Uh, oh, Utica, Utica area. Yeah, yeah that's uh, where you have New a lot York. of Ordovician and so into the Silurian, I believe, there. Yeah. yeah. Um, at, at Joggins, mm -hmm. um, Joggins is a, a very special site. It's a UNESCO uh, site, which is a... United Nations oh, yeah, has to do Environmental, mm -hmm. I can't remember what right. the other yeah, ones yeah, stand right. for. Uh, but it's a very special site, and they used to allow collecting there from anything that has eroded off the cliffs. You weren't allowed to oh, chop chip into, things okay, out of the right. cliffs. Mm -hmm. But if it had eroded off, you could pick it up. Mm. They since don't allow that oh, okay. uh, I didn't know uh, anymore. Mm -hmm. um, uh, however, uh, these fossils here came from Joggins. These are the Lepidodendron, mm -hmm. okay, with the the, the classic. Yeah, um, right. Uh, that back. Yep. This is this is another one. Yeah, the back texture okay. like that. Mm -hmm. And um, here is a. I don't know if the camera can. I don't know if they'll see it, it but if the camera can get this, but if you see these little. Trails that I'll use the Calamites from Joggins <laughs> to follow these little trails. Fold it up. <laughs> yeah, flatter. Okay. Yep. Okay, and there's the trails. Now, you talk about um, uh, big dragonflies and other <laughs> invertebra invertebrates, that this was um, thought to be the trail from a Othro, I wrote it down, Othroloplura. 
Okay, which okay. was a uh, like a giant millipede right. that was um, it would get three five feet mm. long. Yeah, right. And <laughs> trackways, you know. Yeah, right. About like that, mm -hmm. and you can you can see, you know, as it's oh yeah sure going across all those legs. Yeah, going across, and you see similar similar trackways to this. Um, that lobsters make. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. Today, this would be a trace fossil. Yes, exactly. Trace fossils are usually tracks, uh, anything left behind that is not, you know, the actual uh, creature. Uh, trilobite tracks. Uh, they make little tracks with their tiny little uh, legs. Um, annelid worms. Uh, they they used to burrow and uh, secrete stuff to form worm tubes. Yeah, uh, to, and so those would be a trace fossil as well. The worm mm -hmm. is not there, but the tubes remain. Yeah. And of course, footprints. Oh yes. Okay, and that's a whole other topic. That, oh yeah. Uh, uh, we have to get to. I mean, footprints like this guy would make. Oh yeah. Okay. Maybe, and, yes. And, uh, um, and you'll see maybe. Friends. Yeah, footprints of say uh, smaller. Thing crossing its path, and yes. then no more small footprints. Yes. Guess the big ones continue yeah. on their way. Yeah, we went out to see some. Uh, 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 Carol and I went out to see some um, uh, prints out in the Holyoke Mass area, uh, mm. in the Connecticut River Valley. Uh, yeah. There's some Triassic That's red right. beds yes. out there, which really had some spectacular um, uh, uh, footprints out there. But I digress a little bit. <laughs> Well, here's just one little uh, other thing. This is also a little Calamites from mm -hmm. Joggins Cove. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's a small and explain one, what a Calamites is. It's a not, well. The, most of the plants then were not real. They weren't typical flowering plants. They were had long stems. They did have fronds on the top, usually fern and type. But those are much of what you found in the Carboniferous per period. Mm -hmm. And you can see very clearly. On here, mm -hmm. I mean, this is a um, uh, a section right. of this, a calamites yeah. stem, right. which would, you know, <laughs> yeah, this, right, this much is bigger, you know, right. much yeah. bigger, mm -hmm. um, and you can clearly see the um, yeah the plant ridges, yeah, if you want the, to call the, them, yeah, that. plant <laughs> ridges, very nice. Mm -hmm. But there were uh, an innumerable amounts of ferns and you know these type of things, and Carboniferous always had a little bit of held a little bit of fascination for me. Yeah. So here we are. We're in the uh, uh, Carboniferous period. Uh, we we still have uh, invertebrate invertebrate species. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, huge coal beds that are forming. They're not. Coal, right? But they're yeah, yeah but, but they're but mm -hmm. but, but they're, they're the forming. source material. Of okay, coal. Um, these deposits must be valued by oil companies. Oh, definitely, oil and coal. I mean, they are the prime primary fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So um, that's you know the way these were found. It was more than likely they were just excavating coal and found. Yeah, hey, these are good fossils. You know, we'll take them out. But generally, uh, oil and, and coal are fossil fuels. So, mm -hmm. you know, they keep uh, they keep our society running today, as it were. Mm -hmm. The um, let's talk a little more about um, uh, trace fossils. Uh, that whole study called ichnology. I think it is. Ichnology. Mm -hmm. Apparently a lot of that got its origins in Massachusetts, out in the Holyoke uh, area. Some of, the, some of the first studies of um, fossil trackways. Yeah, because uh, they occurred. found them right and they were exposed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, uh, they were found by some farmer <laughs> out there. You know, yep. excavating away, mm -hmm. and um, lo and behold, they found what looked like footprints. Mm -hmm. um, and and this would have been on the uh, near near the Connecticut uh, River Valley right area. 
which apparently that was an area that was a failed separation boundary uh, of plate tectonics. When, when, when the continents were together, yeah. um, the Pangea was together, it was going to break apart. Mm -hmm. There were a couple false starts. Oh, okay. Okay, yes, where so rips mean, occurred, right. sure. you mm -hmm. know, so there was stretching. Yeah. And some of that stretching occurred out in the uh, uh, Connecticut River Valley area, so it exposed a lot of the Triassic mm -hmm. uh, red beds uh, along uh, the river valleys, and uh, they are just peppered with um, uh, fossils. Well, yeah, the Connecticut River Valley uh, also has a lot of uh, the fish fossils, like the one you have there. Oh, let's show that. You know, those are a little bit later, by, uh, but still, they are very, very, you know, interesting items, and there's a lot of them that are found in that area in those, uh, in those beds. Yeah, this particular one came from the, can you guess? Green River? Yeah, Green, mm -hmm. Green, Green River, um, which um, uh, you see thousands and thousands yes, and thousands of right. fish fossils. right, it's very prolific, fossils. right. Uh, uh, from uh, uh, Green Green River, is that in Idaho, Montana area, um, Wyoming? Oh, you got me now. I, 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 I know the the area. I but think I the Idaho the area, but uh, the fossil, the the imprints are, mm -hmm. you know, they're excellent. Yep, they're excellent. Um, let's see. There's a great museum in the Holyoke area, uh, Amherst College. It's on the campus of Amherst College, and it's called the Beneski Museum. Oh, and really? It has a fantastic collection of uh, fossils, and they're they're pretty much uh, their collection of Miocene fossils are are incredible. Uh, mastodons, mm -hmm. uh, saber-toothed tigers, things wow. like that. But we're still in. Yeah, right. <laughs> we're, we're, we're still in the Carboniferous. Yeah. So what else do you have over here? Well, a lot of them are basically, uh, as you can see, they are uh, they're the different types of ferns, as I say. There's ne Neuropterus, Pecopterus, Alithopterus, and uh, Marioptorus mm -hmm. again. So these are, this is pretty nice one. Um, That's beautiful. Yeah, you know, a nice impression here. Look at the impression on that. And I think this is the one that's an, a complete, well, from an nodule. I had one that was, I think this is part of one that came as a complete nodule and then was separated mm -hmm. into the uh, two component parts. So you have the negative and the positive here. Oh. But they were, like I said, there was an abundance of them and some unidentified, just, you can see just some leaf structure in there and that little piece of coal shale. And that's what most of these are. Oh, this one is a perfect one. This one was Siderite nodule, and this goes together neatly. Oh, was, look so at that. that's an, another fern. Look at that. So some fossil hunter yep, found, found that, something like, like that. this. Yep, and uh, took okay. out the concretion and was able to split it. And then they split it. Yeah, and usually it'll break on the beds, but not always. And Sometimes you have you'll the get mangled. And the negative. Exactly. That's, that's, uh, that's a neat one. Wow. And what kind of, uh, what's the matrix? I that, think they said siderite, which siderite. is, yeah, which uh, I'd have to look up to r remind myself which what it is, because there's so many compositions. You, you, you can see that that fits. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah perfectly. Beautifully. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Great. So that's what most of these are reminiscent of the plants of the Carboniferous period. And uh, that's why I have them here. Some of them are not very good. This is like a single big leaf and very hard to see. But when you're into the geosciences, you know, you don't, uh, you know, sometimes that's all you can find. Yeah. Well, there is a difference, and, and you, you told this to me the other night, um, between a good fossil for collecting and a great fossil for gaining insight about what happened. And you want to talk a little about okay, that? Okay, well, that, uh, a lot of that denotes to the times of, of the dinosaurs especially. They were doing some, <clears throat> some speculation on the Tyrannosaurus. 
the king of the uh, reptiles, and whether he was a scavenger or a hunter. And they figured that he was now, they figured he was both. But as an efficient hunter, uh, you know, the, he would, they figured he would have to be attacking animals, and there should be some e evidence of that. So <laughs> you have a Tyrannosaurus like Sue who falls down in, say, a quicksand bog and is perfectly yeah. preserved and there's no, no nothing to worry about. That's mm -hmm. fine. But then uh, people started looking at some of these others that am mostly amateurs had. And, like, a guy had a carcass of a triceratops, pieces of the bottom lower half, and it was all torn up. But in it, when the uh, paleontologist studied it, they saw marks of teeth, T-Rex teeth, in fact, mm -hmm. very, very definitively. And they said that they were going to start looking more for them, although less spectacular than a big T-Rex in, uh, in a museum. These things gave an insight into what was going on in the world. Yes. These torn apart fossils, which people would overlook, are now becoming valuable. These give us the information that we're looking for. Did yeah. this thing was a hunter, and he's hunted this and tore it apart. Yeah. So all of this, that's where the value is of collector value versus study. Mm -hmm. uh, there's so much, um, you know, so much more that you can glean from that. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, you mentioned Sue. Yes. So I feel like we need to mention Sue. Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you got me to uh, um, read up a bit about Sue, and Sue was uh, a name given to the most complete T. Rex skeleton found. Yes, exactly. A very, very good condition, almost a hundred percent complete, and uh, I forget some museum bought it for eight and a half million. I don't yeah. remember who, but you know that was a big plus. But I, I remember reading on a uh, hearing on a show, and they had done a section of uh, one. I think it might have been the femur, and uh, to study it, and they uh, the bone in there has basically rings like growth rings, and they said Sue, this big massive creature, was only twenty eight years old. Yes, yes, yes. That fascinated me because I thought these were like you know hundreds and hundreds of years old and slowly grow like some of the giant crocodiles and alligators. No, they grew real big, real fast. Very, very, very quickly. Yep. Yeah. And, and the name Sue, from what I read, was uh, the name of the paleontologist that found this. Her name was Sue. Oh, was it? Okay, that you I know. wasn't sure of. And, and, name. and uh, <laughs> apparently she found it. They were, they were ready to leave their collect collecting site and their vehicles had broke down. So Sue mm -hmm. had said, uh, geez, I'm going to wander over here and look yeah, at this right. and that. And uh, lo and behold, she found some things that looked pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. And she decided to stay there longer and uh, uh, pull out some more of the crew to um Yep. I mean, the Badlands of Montana, them. where a lot yeah. of this is found, are not, is not a very friendly place to right. be. But you go where the, you know, where the fossils are. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, this this uh, gets us a little bit into the Ordovician. Um, we still have a lot of time left to cover. Tony. Oh man, you have a, a tremendous okay. amount. Okay, but for this segment of uh, Littleton Rocks, we're going to call this a wrap here at the Ordovician, and um, we hope that uh, you found this informative. Um, I, I know I do. So yeah, Tony, well, thank you. jump from the Ordovician to the Carboniferous, don't Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were on the Carboniferous. <laughs> yeah. yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. that, uh, little, that's right. Mm -hmm. so we brought yeah, it all I mean, the way up. Yeah. We, we, yeah, we brought it up uh, 200 million years. I yes. was off there. <laughs> I misstated that. Okay. Um, thank you for watching, and Tony, thank you. Oh, very you're much. very welcome. Okay. A pleasure. Thank you. Mm -hmm.